My friends, am I the only one who's ever wondered if Napoleon could have won the mighty battle of Waterloo? I even went to Napoleon's tomb in Paris to get an answer. I went to his statue in the middle of the Alps. And while tracing back his journey, this is where I understood just how close he was from victory. I'll be honest, as a military history nerd, sometimes I just contemplate the map. I look at both armies, their moves, the commanders, the units, everything. I wouldn't say obsessive, but... <laughs> so I decided, oh shit, buddy, I gotta dig a little deeper. I'm just wondering, what are the mistakes Napoleon has done to allow victory to slip away from his fingers? Talking about the sequence of events is easy, but the missing part is why. The explanation behind every move. So today, I welcome you in this special edition of the headquarters, where you'll be part of Napoleon's staff. We'll analyze key decision points according to the information that Napoleon had available at that time. Oh yeah, and in this video, we'll be doing a lot of myth-busting. Winners of the Battle of Waterloo, according to British historians. Yeah, baby! <laughs> In reality, at Waterloo, of the 67,000 men the Duke of Wellington had under his command, 17,000 were Dutch or Belgian, and 26,000 were part of his German allies. Only 35% were actually British. If we add the 50,000 Prussian reinforcements, the British contingent decreases to 20%, whereas the Germans jump to 65%. We can say with confidence that the army that defeated Napoleon for good at Waterloo was German. To understand just how close the French army was from victory at Waterloo, we really have to look at the entire campaign. But what I don't understand is why some historians focus so much on the battle itself. They get so granular and they get lost in details. When the most interesting is everything that happened before the moment he left the island of Elba, it's one of the most epic journeys you'll ever hear about. This video is sponsored by War Thunder. War Thunder is the most comprehensive vehicle combat game ever made. You can play with over 2,000 tanks, planes, helicopters, and ships, ranging from World War II to the Cold War, in dynamic combined arms PvP battles. What I love the most about War Thunder is its detailed damage where tanks suffer actual damage to their components and crew instead, plus the damage x-ray that shows exactly what happened. You can download War Thunder by clicking the link in the description. Oh yeah, on top of that, War Thunder also allows you to customize systems for vehicles, apply hundreds of camouflage, place historical markings anywhere on your machines as well as 3D decorators such as bushes and various equipment. And you know me as a history nerd, I really enjoyed War Thunder's World War II Atlantic campaign. It's very tactical because you have to find a way to strike supply convoys, all the while paying attention to enemy escort ships. Play War Thunder for free on PC, Xbox and PlayStation. Use my link to download the game and get your exclusive bonus. Multiple premium vehicles, premium account, boosters and much more. See you on the battlefield. Before we talk about Waterloo, we need some foreplay. Napoleon was now exiled on the island of Elba. His life was miserable. He was governing over a rock. His Austrian wife, Marie-Louise, and his son, nicknamed Leglon, would not join him. And the new royalist government in France had not sent him the promised money. Meanwhile, in France, King Louis XVIII returned from exile. He thought he could just sit on the throne and erase 25 years of drunken glory. And this made him very unpopular. So early 1815, Napoleon looks at his destiny and he's like, all or nothing. He secretly prepared his escape from Elba by repairing old warships. And on February 26, he slipped away with some 1,000 of his veterans. A small expeditionary force disembarked at Gorjouan on March 1st. And only once the area was secured did the emperor follow. <laughs> he sent an 80-strong detachment of grenadiers, hoping to rally the 87th regiment garrisoned at Antibes. But the commander was hostile. He trapped the detachment and forced them to surrender. So Napoleon avoided the fanatically royalist region of Provence and bypassed it through the Alps for more friendly lands. 
The objective was to reach Paris as fast as possible. Most of Napoleon's former marshals mocked his adventure and claimed that it was a folly and that they could easily crush him. But I promise your majesty I'll bring him back to Paris in an iron cage. And Massena, now commander of the corps of Marseille, sent the 83rd and 58th line infantry regiments to stop the intruder. Their objective was the fortress of Sisteron and the only bridge over the Durance River. But Napoleon got there first and this allowed them to pass without trouble. And all along his way, peasants gathered to see the emperor. They've heard so much about him and now he's there in front of them. They yelled, vive l'empereur. But the upper class was less enthusiastic. On March 7th, the Royalist 5th Line Infantry blocked Napoleon's route at La Frey. This is the famous moment where Napoleon stepped in front of the Royalist Infantry and they refused to fire. In the end, all these troops sent by the king would join forces with the emperor. Unlike what is portrayed in movies, Ney wasn't there. He would only join Napoleon a couple days later. So yeah, I went to La Frey, and in reality, the landscape is very different. There is a narrow road flanked by a lake on one side and tall, gloomy, forested mountains on the other. The perfect location for an ambush. Hearing about this event, Colonel Labédoyère and his 5th Line Infantry Regiment rushed towards Napoleon and pulled out the old imperial eagle of his regiment and joined ranks with the emperor as well. The commanders of the entire garrison of Grenoble fled as they lost control of their troops who called for the emperor. Napoleon now had an army of 5,500. The crown prince brought troops to Lyon, hoping to defeat Napoleon in battle. The crown prince had no military experience. His troops laughed, threw away the royalist flag and started rebelling. All the crown prince could do was flee. Napoleon was unstoppable and he probably felt that he was pushed by destiny. At this point, everyone in the king's cabinet was shaking and showing great courage and loyalty, they all fled abroad. And on March 20th, Napoleon entered Paris. <laughs> Now the story could have stopped there. Napoleon hoped the Allies would be so busy with their infighting that they would kind of forget about him, but they didn't. They immediately declared Napoleon an outlaw and mobilized the armies to march on France once again. The emperor believed a rapid show of force could dismantle the new coalition mobilized against him and secure his position in France for good. Ah oh, shit, here we go again. I mean, that's what he said every year for 10 years to face the impending danger Napoleon needed an army. The problem was that the army of the Kingdom of France was in a neglected state since his departure. Napoleon needed the best of the best to rebuild the French army from scratch. So he named Davout as Minister of War, despite the Marshal's protestations for a battlefield role. Without Davout, Napoleon would not even have had the opportunity to have an army at Waterloo. That's how Napoleon's undefeated commander was absent during the Waterloo campaign, but he played a crucial role as Minister of War. At one point during this military buildup, General Gérard, commander of the 4th Corps, asked Davout if Bourmont could be one of his division commanders. Davout essentially said, you can pick anyone except Bourmont. Four times he gets the same request, and eventually it's Napoleon himself that orders him to accept Bourmont within his ranks. Remember the name, remember the name. Davout was unhappy with Napoleon's judgment and preferential treatment. He picked his generals mostly based on loyalty and not on skills. As he progressed during his career, he felt more and more like a Corsican mafia boss. Good. Napoleon tried to place his family members all over the hierarchy. Even after Davout's objections, Jérôme, Napoleon's younger brother, secured a commanding position despite his non-existent military skills. Davout experienced it himself that whenever Jérôme showed up on the battlefield, things went to shit. Like we saw before, by spring 1815, the French army was far from combat ready. But Davout's tireless efforts quickly turned things around. 
He pushed factories to increase the production of firearms, artillery, uniforms, and supplies. The cavalry corps was so weak and neglected, but Davout went above and beyond to reform 58 cavalry regiments, a miracle without which a military campaign could have not even been possible. Davout even asked Napoleon to implement a dictatorship to push military production at an all-time high. As for manpower, here's the reality. Napoleon wasn't that welcome, so he didn't dare call up another round of the widely unpopular conscription. He was lucky thousands of his veterans and volunteers flocked to the call to arms. They were ready for one more taste of drunken glory. And this is why they loved Napoleon, because he portrayed that more than anyone else. By early June, Napoleon had 200,000 men available throughout France, and another 70,000 in training. Cool story, bro, but you have 1 million Allied soldiers converging on France on all fronts. The battle is imminent. As part of the headquarters, here are the two choices that Napoleon was facing. Option 1. Cry for Josephine to come back. Ridley? Just kidding. Option 1. He could wait for the new troops in training to be ready and use the set of fortresses along the border to halt the enemy. Option 2. Punch first and force his enemies to the negotiating table. The gamble could work. The Austrian and Russian armies were still far away, but the Anglo-Dutch under the Duke of Wellington and the Prussians led by General Feldmarschall Blücher had 200,000 men deployed right across the border in Belgium. In the end, he chose option two. Option one was rejected because the fortresses were in a deplorable state. And the emperor remembered how in 1814 he was forced into a purely defensive stance and it failed. So this time he would defeat his enemies in detail. And he would attack the armies of the coalition before they could reunite their forces. That was his favorite strategy he used so wonderfully during his younger years in Italy. With fortune still smile at him 20 years later. After all, Napoleon's bold march from southern France had been pretty successful. What could possibly stop him now? Now, as part of Napoleon's staff, the question is how to tackle these guys and drag them through the mud. In order to maintain secrecy, Napoleon waited for the last moment to direct his army corps towards Belgium. This French buildup was so rapid and unexpected that the Anglo-Dutch and Prussian armies did not have time to join their forces. The Armée du Nord only had 125,000 troops available against 200,000. The enemy benefited from 50% extra manpower to even out the odds he needed one of his two adversaries out from the battlefield. For sure he could have bought his way out, but he didn't have any cash. So battle it is. As part of the fog of war, I won't show you the exact positions of the coalition forces. So I'll just show you the general information Napoleon had available. One option was to push north towards Ghent and threaten Wellington supply lines and force his army to retreat to Antwerp. Number two, Napoleon could also march towards Namur and cut off the Prussians from their communication lines. However, both of these scenarios would push his enemies right towards each other. So he decided to move in a wedge formation right in between the two enemy armies, aiming to defeat them individually. What do you think? Should he have focused on the Anglo-Dutch or the Prussians? The Allies believed that Napoleon's offensive towards Belgium was so illogical that they saw no particular need to regroup. I mean, they outnumbered him two to one. However, on the 3rd of May, the Duke of Wellington and Blücher held a strategy conference. Both parties agreed that if the French attacked, the Prussians would prepare for battle near Sombref, and Wellington promised to link up with the Prussians. Ironically, Wellington did not speak German, and Blücher and his staff didn't understand English. So their conversation happened in French. Wellington promised his help to the Prussians because he was so confident that the French would not attack, that the Duke attended a gala ball with the Prince of Orange, the Duke of Brunswick, the Prince of Nassau, Lord Uxbridge, and 22 colonels. 72 hours later, almost half of those officers would be wounded, or KIA. Let's say the British did not go bros before. Romantic interests. June 15th, Napoleon crossed the French-Belgian border. Since the objective was to keep the Anglo-Dutch and the Prussians apart, 
the eagle fell upon his first prey, the dangerously isolated first Prussian corps commanded by von Zitten. Now if the French could pour down on this exposed Prussian corps fast enough and capture the bridges across the Sambre River, the emperor would cripple one-fourth of the Prussian forces on day one. However, the French army of 1815 was not the same that took Europe by storm a decade earlier. Napoleon's had troops, but he needed capable commanders. Most of his marshals and generals and military commanders decided to join the king and the royalists. In other words, Napoleon was left with the bench warmers and lots of new faces were promoted. In the end, Marshal Soult replaced Berthier as chief of staff. But he was not as meticulous and careful when issuing orders as his predecessor. So that's how Van Damme, commander of the 3rd Corps, ended up 5 hours behind schedule because the messenger carrying that marching order broke his leg on his way. This would have never happened in the past because Marshal Berthier had always made sure to send orders in duplicate by different messengers to ensure their proper delivery. Sadly for Napoleon, upon his return, Chief of Staff Berthier decided to flee the country with the king and two weeks before the Battle of Waterloo, Berthier would mysteriously fall down the third floor of a castle in Bavaria. First blood happened at Thouin. Per the north, French battalion stormed the bridge at Charleroi. Despite some delays, things were going well. The enemy had already lost 1,500 KIA or captured. Now the crucial step for the French was to destroy the dangerously spread out 30,000 Prussians of the 1st Corps positions behind the river. The moment they had crossed the Sambre River, it seemed the French army could not catch the resolve and defiance it once had. On top of that, due to poor planning from the chief of staff, Many French units converged on the same road leading to Charleroi, resulting in a massive traffic jam around the bridge. By the end of June 15th, Napoleon had already lost momentum. Lieutenant General von Zitten not only managed to withdraw his army corps in the face of a much more numerous enemy, but with great skill, the Prussian commander carried a fighting retreat in good order as his rear guard slowed down the French at Gosli and Gilly. Ultimately, this allowed him to regroup his 1st Corps with the Prussian 2nd and 3rd Corps between Sombref and Ligny. Exactly what Blücher had planned a month before that. So the Prussians maneuvered with excellence. Even worse, in the early hours of June 15, a French division commander deserted with his entire staff. Not only that, he went to the Prussians. His name? Bourmont. That's right. General Bourmont warned the Prussians about the impending attack on Charleroi, handed them all the marching orders and the exact strength of the French army. Apparently, Blücher was so disgusted by Bourmont, called his desertion right before battle disgraceful, and didn't even want to speak to him. Even though the first maneuver did not end up as Napoleon had expected, the French troops still managed to position themselves in between the Anglo-Dutch and the Prussians. He benefited from this central position that allowed him to strike one of his opponents and then move on to the second one. Marshal Ney, nicknamed the bravest of the brave, arrived at Napoleon's headquarters ready for duty at 7 p.m. on the 15th of June. Remember when I asked you, should Napoleon focus on the Prussians or the Anglo-Dutch? Marshal Ney suggested focusing on Wellington. The idea would be to send some troops to keep the Prussians in check and concentrate on the British, which he considered by far the most dangerous enemy. After all, he faced them in Spain. However, Napoleon wanted to deal with the Prussians first. I mean, it makes sense because the Prussians were the closest to his position. Ney was a brave commander, but his battle plan would have left the French main supply line vulnerable to the entire Prussian army. Meanwhile, the Duke of Wellington still believed the assault on Charleroi to be a feint, and that the real objective was Mons. Soon enough, he realized his mistake. He wasn't facing the same French generals that were fighting him in Spain, and he hastily sent out marching orders to his dispersed army. Oh my god! Okay, it's happening! Everybody stay calm! What's the Everybody procedure, everyone? Calm. What's the procedure? Stay calm! Wait, 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 wait. Everybody, calm down! 
There was so much chaos on the roads that none of Wellington's force would be able to support the Prussians as promised. On top of that, the Prussian 4th Corps under von Bulow flat out ignored his first marching orders due to his animosity with Chief of Staff Gneisenau. What Napoleon would have done in the past would have been to dispatch a small detachment to stall Army A, while the bulk of his troops crushed Army B. But that day, he went against his own principle. The right wing, meant to decisively defeat the Prussians, was reduced. While the detachment, meant to stall the enemy on the left wing, was considerably strengthened. That means from the get-go, Napoleon would not benefit from a decisive advantage on either flank. The lack of cavalry also made him uncertain of enemy whereabouts. And perhaps he thought the British would advance much faster towards him. At this point, Blücher could have retreated to regroup with von Bülow's 30,000 men and avoid a pitch battle against the military genius Napoleon. Why didn't he follow common sense? Because Wellington had promised to support him in the battle to come. The Prussian staff and the headquarters had expressed their doubts regarding the trustworthiness of their British allies, especially when Wellington had shown no signs that his troops were advancing towards them. But Blücher dismissed the very legitimate warnings of his generals. Now something strange happened. In the morning of June 16th, Napoleon remained passive. In the past, he would wake up early in the morning and write one marching order after the other. He lost mental focus. But this time he constantly asked about what was happening in Paris. He was worried about the royalists plotting behind his back. And there were growing calls from the liberal elites to overthrow him and lost a precious five hours before issuing marching orders. But what got very confusing for everyone is that Napoleon also openly declared that the political objective of the campaign was to capture Brussels. So as Ney was marching north, he fully believed his axis was the primary one. But this would come to bite the French army in the Bunda later. As of now, the emperor carefully analyzed the disposition of the Prussian army. He was convinced that Blücher would not dare face him in battle, especially without his allies. He looked at the map and this was his logic. If the Prussians wanted to protect their lines of communications with their homeland, they would have positioned themselves perpendicular to the Fleurus road. So why would the Prussians intentionally overextend their right wing towards Wagnelet? This could only mean that they expected the arrival of British reinforcements on their right flank. In an instant, Napoleon had guessed the entire Prussian battle plan. As part of the headquarters and staff, here are the three battle plans that you suggest to the Emperor. Number one, attack the weaker Prussian left flank and cut them off from their supply lines. Problem, this would put the Prussians to retreat on their right flank, directly towards the British, and right into Marshal Ney's rear. Number two, flank the Prussian right, isolate the enemy from any British reinforcements, and force them to withdraw back to Germany. However, if the Prussians counterattack, it would leave the Fleurus Charleroi road open to the enemy. Number three, attack the Prussians all over the line and rush towards the bulk of their army. Although it's the simplest battle plan because no maneuver is needed, casualties could be heavy. Napoleon chose option 3. Without waiting for Derlon's 17,000 and Lobo's 10,000 men, Napoleon sent roughly 60,000 French troops to battle. The emperor did not know that he actually faced the bulk of the Prussian army in Ligny and the surrounding villages. That is 80,000 to 90,000 heavily entrenched Prussians. Napoleon failed to understand that over the years, that the Prussians were not scared of the French as they once were. General Feldmarschall Blücher had a lot of experience with Napoleon. Battles of Auerstadt, Lützen, Bautzen, Katzbach, Leipzig, Brienne, La Rotière, Chambopère, Vauchamp. Blücher knew Napoleon is not the guy you play fancy with, but he still managed to defeat Napoleon two times at Leipzig and La Rotière. In both these battles, Napoleon was heavily outnumbered and suffered from an unexpected enemy flanking maneuver. And Blücher fully expected to reiterate the same winning strategy a third time. On June 16th, Blücher and Wellington met once again at noon. 
where the British general promised him once again 20,000 to 30,000 men by 4 p.m. Interestingly, the Battle of Ligny that Blücher had thought of and prepared was only a reversed Waterloo. Except this time, the Prussians weren't to entrench and stand their ground, while the British would come roaring with a flanking attack. After the war, Marshal Davout would write that Napoleon's battle plan at Ligny was the one of a senile butcher. I'm paraphrasing, but that's essentially what he said. Instead of an elegant maneuver, he sadly noticed that it's the Napoleon from the Battle of Borodino during the campaign of Russia that took over, the one that wanted to take the bull by its horns. Perhaps this is when Napoleon's flame and military genius had just but dried out. As you expected, Lini was far from a masterpiece, but simply the battle consisted of a series of messy frontal attacks and counterattacks back to back for a couple villages which saw entire battalions melting away in bloody house to house fighting. One side yelling, Vorwärts, Bayonet Angriff, and the other, Vive l'Empereur. Although the Prussians benefited from being on the defense, the Prussians lost a lot of troops during their charges due to screens of French skirmishers that would evade them while unleashing precise fire from tall crops and various concealed positions. The greatly skilled French artillery also brought their cannons right into the enemy's face and had them fire at point blank. Canister rounds devastated Prussian ranks as cannonballs shattered buildings and bounced off in the streets. The cannonballs were not huge, I mean, they were maybe big like that, but it's not something you want bouncing at full speed towards you. To summarize the battle, on the left flank, the hot-headed Vandamme launched a furious charge and captured Saint-Amand, but then the Prussians counterattacked. for the reminder of the day was rinse and repeat. Same thing in the center, where 9,000 Prussians defending the village of Ligny lost ground to General Gérard's 9,000. Meanwhile, on the right flank, Grouchy's cavalry simply faced Tiedemann's 3rd Army Corps, made up mostly of low-quality Landwehr infantry, aka the reserve. Fun fact, von Tiedemann was a Saxon. He fought with Napoleon's army from 1807 to 1813. Fun fact number two, Tiedemann's chief of staff was a colonel named Karl von Clausewitz. That's right, the famous military thinker. June 16th was coming to an end. Despite a numerical advantage, Blücher had exhausted his infantry reserves. The British had to come now or he would be defeated. The French army was applying pressure on the entire front. And this is when Napoleon decided to apply the coup de grace and launched 10 battalions of the old guard right in the center. Blücher must have felt a bit desperate as he charged with three cavalry regiments against the French Imperial Guard. They were halted by the French squares and decimated by the countercharge of the guards' cuirassiers. Even worse, Blücher's horse was hit and the general fell to the ground, trapping him underneath. Two more charges of French cuirassiers passed over him. Can you imagine the disaster had Blücher been captured? Not sure the Prussians would have continued the campaign. Depends on what level of difficulty you play the campaign on. In the end, the British reinforcements never showed up and the Prussians retreated from Ligny, Napoleon's last victory, but at what cost? The French had lost 8 to 12,000 casualties, and the Prussians 12 to 16,000. Now, according to Wellington's post-war records, during that meeting at lunch, he supposedly criticized the Prussian battle plan. Our boy Welly 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 is a liar. There's not a single witness corroborating his claims. Even worse, the witnesses actually concur. They all agree that Wellington reiterated his promise to Blücher. And this is what convinced the German General Feldmarschall to accept battle with his 4th Corps missing. While Napoleon was battering against the Prussian defenses, another battle took place 9 kilometers to the west at a crossroad called Quatre Bras. However, that day, Napoleon didn't have his Iron Marshal Davout in charge. We all remember the Battle of Awashtat in 1806, where Davu, with only 26,000, humiliated the Duke of Brunswick and his 64,000 Prussians. This spectacular victory put a real shadow on Napoleon's win at the simultaneous Battle of Jena. 
By the way, Napoleon was so jealous of Davu for that battle that he never allowed him to be called Prince of Auerstadt. <laughs> anyway, the big drama that day is that the emperor sent out a very ambiguous order to Ne. And if we look at the written orders, it wasn't even clear for me. All that Ne could read is that his mission was only to push towards the crossroad of Quatre Bras. Not even capture the place, just push towards it. British historians constantly mock and denigrate their Dutch allies for being cowards and overall bad soldiers. But on June 16th, it's the Dutch contingent that saved the day. While Wellington and his staff were still in a complete disorder against Wellington's orders, the Dutch took the initiative and thanks to General Perponché, concentrated at Quatre Bras. That's why in the morning of June 16th, Ney already found the enemy in control of this strategic position. Nowadays, a lot of historians are highly critical of Marshal Ney for not being aggressive enough despite a 2 to 1 advantage. Because in theory, Ney had 20,000 men and the Dutch in front of him only had 8,000. But it's easy for them to say now that we have all the facts and the full picture. In reality, instead of just bashing Ney, we have to praise the Dutch for their tactical skills. When Perponché and the 23-year-old Prince of Orange arrived on the battlefield, they managed to position their 8,000 infantry and 16 cannons in such a way as to appear to contain double that number. On top of that, the Dutch troops decided to be hyper-aggressive, giving the impression that they were much more numerous. Meanwhile, visibility was bad due to the tall crops, and most importantly, they only had 14,000 men at the start of the battle. Also, we can believe that General Ray, a veteran of the Peninsular War, thought it was a trap laid by Wellington and suggested caution. Just like at Ligny, the battle started late around 1 or 2 p.m. I won't necessarily go into details, but a lot of the tactical situation that unfolded at Quatre Bras foreshadowed the Battle of Waterloo. The Dutch troops of the Prince of Orange repelled May's initial timid attacks, but soon they started to fall back. I say Dutch to simplify, but in reality, of the first 10 battalions, four were Dutch, one Belgian, and the five others were Germans from Nassau. The Dutch 5th militia tried to stop the French using the stronghold of the Gemioncourt farm, but they got dislodged by six battalions of the French line infantry. Honestly, Ney led a very good battle. 3.6. Not great, not terrible. Instead of charging the woods that could hide X number of enemy troops and then be pinned down there, the idea was to push in the center, capture the Gemioncourt farm, push to the crossroad, and flank the enemy positions. Essentially, the Prince of Orange was saved by the bell. By 3.30 p.m., a lot of Allied reinforcements started to appear, like Maryland's Netherlands Cavalry Brigade, General Picton's infantry, composed of two British brigades of battle-hardened veterans of the Peninsula War, one Hanoverian brigade as well as Brunswickers. This is when the French started to get pushed back. But 30 minutes later, it was Ney's turn to smile, as Jerome Bonaparte arrived with 8,000 reinforcements. He was tasked to storm and flank the Bossu Wood. Then it was the Duke of Wellington's turn to arrive on the battlefield with some more reinforcements. Marshal Ney compensated for his lack of troops by making heavy use of his cavalry. At one point, French lancers almost captured the Prince of Orange, and in their charge, they almost got Wellington as well. But he was lucky to find refuge behind the 92nd Highlanders. Okay, is it me or the French came that close to capturing Blucher, the Prince of Orange, and Wellington. Oh man, what a disaster that was avoided. Honestly, the battle was chaotic. For example, the same Highlanders of the 92nd would unleash a deadly volley on the friendly 5th Belgian Light Dragoons they mistook for French. And due to language problems, Sir Andrew rejected the warning of the cowardly Dutch and charged right into a French artillery battery. The French cavalry that day was unstoppable and showed the full wrath of the Furia Francese. Curiciers trampled the 69th and 73rd British foot regiments. At one point, French chasseurs on horse were concealed behind a slope and caught the foot guard by surprise. Within minutes, the unit ceased to exist. At another part of the front, the French lancers charged. The British line infantry mistook them for friendly Hanoverians. And that's how two British battalions got wiped out despite having formed squares. 
That's the tragedy of it all. The tactics that worked so well for the French at Quatre Bras would two days later become the root of their defeat. In the late afternoon, although the Anglo-Dutch were now twice as numerous, Ney was holding out. All he needed was the extra 17,000 men from Derlon. But despite sending countless messengers, Derlon was not there. And he would never show up. Without these crucial reinforcements, Ney was forced into a defensive posture for the rest of the day. What happened is that Derlon's 17,000 men wandered for the duration of the day from one battlefield to another and neither had a decisive impact at Ligny nor Quatre Bras. French Chief of Staff Marshal Soult later wrote, If Comte Derlon had executed the movement which the Emperor had ordered, the Prussian army would have been totally destroyed and we would have taken perhaps 30,000 prisoners. So where was Derlon. Historians still debate about it to this day, but very few are aware that in 1829, the French general himself explained what happened on this dreadful day. Comte Derlon claims that he only received an order to march towards Quatre Bras on Friday, June 16th at 11 a.m. Okay, until here, makes sense. Eventually, Napoleon's aide-de-camp, General Labédoyère, handed him a handwritten note ordering to redeploy towards Ligny. What was weird is that it wasn't written with ink like Napoleon usually did, but with pencil. So in the end, we suppose that Labédoyère wrote this order on his own without telling Napoleon, who was probably busy with handling the battle in front of him. As Derlon approached Ligny, Napoleon made no further attempts to make use of these reinforcements. Meanwhile, Marshal Ney kept sending messenger after messenger for immediate help at Quatre Bras. So Derlon rerouted his columns once again. Just in case, he made sure to leave one infantry division and three cavalry regiments in the vicinity of Ligny. As Napoleon still did not get in touch with them, but they could clearly see the battle in front of them, one general argued to march to the sound of cannon and flank the Prussians at Wagnele but the rest of the staff preferred to stay on standby. You see, this is what I mean when the French army of 1815 did not have the same fiery energy as its ancestors from the revolution that would have not even asked but marched directly into battle. And of course, we will never know Ney's perspective of the story because he was placed in front of a firing squad in December 1815 for a high treason against the king. Even more strange, General Labédoyère faced the same fate, but in August 1815. You don't find that suspicious? Oh, I almost forgot the funniest part. Wellington actually reported the Battle of Quatre Bras as a British victory. Come on, don't bullshit me. On a strategic level, our boy Welly 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 could not support the Prussians at Ligny. And on a tactical level, despite a 2 to 1 numerical advantage, he took more casualties, and abandoned the battlefield. <laughs> so I don't even want to know about the criteria of a British defeat. Oh yeah, I almost forgot. This is what Davout said Napoleon should have done at Ligny. The idea was to outmaneuver the enemy and position the divisions west of Marbet and Wagnele. It would have been very difficult for Blücher to redeploy his army at the last moment. From this position, the French army could have flanked the entire enemy line and trapped the Prussians in their own entrenchments. Thousands would have been captured and the Prussian army would have been destroyed for the rest of the campaign. Such a disposition of forces would have allowed Napoleon to be in a real central position and would have enabled much better coordination with Ney at Quatre Bras and Derlon's detachment. I understand if you have tears, okay? Those are manly tears. Only a real man can cry when looking at this perfect battle plan. I'm convinced that Napoleon should have stayed in Paris and consolidated his power and instead should have named Davout as commander-in-chief of his forces in Belgium. But he preferred to share the destiny of warrior kings. At the end of the day, if we take into account Ligny and Quatre Bras, the French had suffered around 16,000 casualties and the Allies around 20,000 meaning the coalition was already winning by attrition. The problem Napoleon faced is that the great numerical advantage allowed the Allied generals to make the biggest mistakes with impunity during the campaign. On a strategic level, Wellington left the crossroad at Quatre Bras and fell back north towards Brussels. And the Prussians had been defeated at Ligny. Although chaotic and costly, 
The situation allowed Napoleon to achieve his larger strategic aim of preventing Wellington's force from linking up with Blücher. Blücher was severely wounded and unable to resume command. Kneisenau, Blücher's chief of staff, took over. The fate of the entire campaign laid upon his shoulders. In the darkness, he rallied thousands of deserters and rerouted all the retreating Prussian units to link up with von Bülow's 4th Corps. Gneisenau was considering a retreat towards Liège, as Wellington had failed to keep his promise twice now, and left the Prussians to fight Napoleon on their own. After the Battle of Ligny, Napoleon went to sleep in Fleurus. Oh, what a mistake to literally sleep on your victory. Young Bonaparte would have never allowed himself such a luxury before knowing that the enemy was fully defeated. Had he stayed in the bivouac with his men, like he used to do in the past, he would have heard that the Prussian army was slipping right under his nose. And Grouchy's cavalry was still intact. It was the moment to act. They could have chased them, but no order came from Napoleon that night. But simply, Napoleon underestimated the old Blücher. And like Clausewitz would later say, the penalty of this mistake reached him like a thunderbolt. Believing the Prussians fully defeated, Napoleon and the bulk of the army rerouted to march against Wellington's retreating army. But Napoleon was unaware of the real situation. Gneisenau actually obeyed Blücher's last orders. The Prussian army did not retreat east as he expected, but marched north. And during this withdrawal, Otto von Bülow's 30,000 men replaced the losses from the previous day. Blücher also sent a letter to Wellington confirming his assistance for the next battle. Without this message, we can think that Wellington would have retreated to the sea. In a way, we can say that Blücher was the real mastermind behind the Waterloo campaign. And that's how the French emperor did not even bother to pursue the enemy. The entire morning of June 17th, he just sat around complaining about the liberals, the senate, the royalists, the bourgeoisie, how everyone was after him in Paris. Napoleon's inaction during these precious Hours at one point made his staff extremely uneasy. At the headquarters, some of the best generals like Drouot, Gérard, and Excellence started to get impatient and mumble to each other. Was Napoleon also like that during his days of glory? Van Damme had enough and yelled out, Napoleon is not the same man we once knew. Only around noon was Marshal Grouchy ordered to chase the Prussians. Noon! 12 hours after the Prussians had already left. And as a matter of fact, Grouchy was devastated by this assignment. According to the reports, he begged Napoleon to transfer this daunting task to someone more suitable for this mission, like Marshal Ney. Also, we can wonder what would have happened if Murat was present that day. But could he really have fixed Napoleon's mistakes? But in the end, we don't know why Napoleon insisted that Grouchy was to lead the pursuit with 30,000 men, mainly cavalry, but supported by the divisions of Van Damme and Gérard. Although these divisions were elite, they had suffered considerable losses at Ligny. So perhaps all they could do was really chase the enemy. I guess that was the reasoning behind Napoleon's strategy. Grouchy's corps was only ready to march off by 3 p.m. One last time, Grouchy, terrified, knowing he wasn't the right guy for the job, asked the emperor if his corps could be part of the main body of the army. Negative. And like that, Napoleon had intentionally divided his already numerically inferior forces. And the worst, it's so tragic, is that just like Napoleon had told him, Grouchy searched for the Prussians on the Meuse, the complete opposite direction that they were actually going. And to this effect, the Prussians tricked the French scouts by abandoning some cannons on the road leading to Namur. How could Grouchy actively pursue Blücher when, one, he doesn't know where they are, Two, he doesn't know what they want. And because of all these unknowns, he was convinced the Prussians were actually preparing to flank him. Grouchy got hesitant and slowed down the march. On June 18th, 1815, Napoleon and his staff observed the battlefield of Waterloo. For us armchair generals, it's easy to criticize what Napoleon did or did not do. But we can't forget that he didn't have satellite imagery. The weather was still foggy, there was rain, and the landscape looked very different from what the emperor imagined. As a matter of fact, he didn't even know about the enemy strongholds in his way. And that's because of the poor work of his scouts. Engineering officer Axel went 
forward with a reconnaissance party. He returned to tell Napoleon that there were no obstacles apart from little barricades on the road. Had he completed his mission properly, he would have seen the fortified farms of Hougomont, La Haye Sainte, and Papelotte. Do you understand that all the French staff was aware of on the left flank is that there were trees and a few buildings, not a fortified compound. Not only did Napoleon have a wrong perception of the battlefield, but he imagined the Prussians to be on the run. He never envisioned that they would dare fight him once again. He was convinced he only had to deal with Wellington's army. And this is what happens when, as a commander, you anchor yourself in a specific ideological position. Numerous reports and rumors from the locals mentioned the arrival of the Prussians, but Napoleon brushed them all off. At this point, it's like watching a car crash in slow motion. Meanwhile, Wellington had time on his side. He used his good old trick to conceal his troops from the French by positioning them behind the ridge perpendicular to the road leading to Brussels. And just like Blücher at Ligny, Wellington also fortified three outposts in front of the slope in order to break down the cohesion of enemy attack columns and make the best use of firepower. The majority of the defenders of Hougomont were German. Same for the 900 defenders of Papelotte and all 450 defenders of La Sainte that were elite riflemen of the King's German Legion. All Wellington had to do was to hold the French long enough for the Prussians to come crush Napoleon's exposed right wing. Reports mention a wave of pessimism among Napoleon's senior officers the morning of the battle. Marshal Soult was one of the few that had experience with fighting the Duke of Wellington. Apparently, he insisted that the enemy army that Napoleon could see wasn't the actual full strength and suggested the battle of maneuver, like what Napoleon did so well in the past. Apparently, he also insisted that Grouchy should be immediately called back to join the main force, but Napoleon thought it was unnecessary because Wellington was a bad general. Shut your mouth, mate! Seriously, even if Napoleon had ordered Grouchy to come back at that moment, there's no way he would have arrived in time to stop the Prussians. That's how at Waterloo, the French army was 69,000 strong, 48,000 infantry, 14,000 cavalry, and 17,000 artillerymen with 250 guns. In front of him, Wellington had 67,000 men, 50,000 infantry, 11,000 cavalry, and 6,000 artillerymen with 150 guns. Of course, Napoleon didn't know the exact composition of the enemy army but he understood that the odds were even and that his military genius would tilt the balance in his favor. Meanwhile, Prussian patrols of Uhlans rode freely east of his position and were observing the disposition of his army. Honestly, the Battle of Waterloo is not that interesting, unlike what many historians make it to be. For sure, like history nerds, we can debate about details, like the rain that impacted the capabilities of the French artillery, the rifles that the British were using, or the tightly packed French infantry column formations mounting the assault. Fact is, all the tactics that the French used at Waterloo were the same ones used two days prior at Ligny and Quatre Bras against the same adversaries. But this time, fortune just smiled the other way. Perhaps Wellington learned from his mistakes during the Battle of Quatre Bras, and knowing his own limitations, preferred to adopt a purely defensive stance for round two. Now back to Napoleon. The real problem was mathematical. No doubt he would have won if he had an extra 100,000 troops. But because there was a lot of discontent about his return to power, he didn't want to call a conscription in fear of riots. And a lot of troops were wasted to suppress various royalist uprisings. For example, over 20,000 men were wasted to suppress a rebellion in the west of the country. Imagine their impact if they had been there at Waterloo that day. The second problem was that just like he did during this entire campaign, Napoleon issued his orders late. While enemy columns were already on the move, in a way the students surpassed the master. For sure we can argue about white flanking maneuvers and all this fancy stuff. But just like Napoleon did at Ligny, the fighting consisted in furious frontal attacks. And anyway, Wellington had already prepared such an option by positioning troops near bren la lude to cover his right flank. But still, let's go through the battle. On the left flank, Jérôme Bonaparte, the tactical genius he is, launched his division forward without scouting the area and without a proper artillery barrage. And that's how one battalion after another was sent into this meat grinder. 
only after four hours of zero progress does Jerome realizes the futility of his endeavor. But it's too late. A total of 33 battalions and some 14,000 muskets had been sucked in into this black hole of Hougamont. Meanwhile, Wellington invested 12,000 muskets for its defense, of which 9,000 were German. On the right flank, D'Arlon attacked with four divisions numbering 16,000 men. In massive column formations, they shoved everything aside on their way, and the first line of Anglo-Dutch troops were soon starting to fall back. And like that, the French actually managed to capture the ridge. And this is when the British cavalry charged. They dealt heavy damage. The 105th French line infantry was cut to pieces. Same for the 28th and 45th line infantry regiments. Like that, a huge chunk of Delon's corps was wasted. I mean, he had the most fresh troops of the entire French army. Made sense that he would open the ceremony. And it's gone! The glorious charge of the British cavalry was stopped by the French lancers, which in return dealt massive casualties. For example, the British 12th Light Dragoons is said to have lost two-thirds of its ranks during that counter-charge. Napoleon's Joker was his Grande Batterie. The problem here is that his cannons could not see the enemy positions properly because of the ridge. Although they tried to adjust fire, Napoleon probably thought that his Grande Batterie inflicted much more damage than it actually did. And surprise surprise, quickly after, 7,000 cavalrymen charged into the enemy lines. Poor Ney, he did not live long enough to tell his side of the story and he was blamed for this entire disaster. Oh yeah, it's time to do some myth busting. Contrary to popular belief, it wasn't only British squares. The first line consisted of five British squares and eight made of Germans, two of the German Legion, four of the Brunswickers and two from Hanover. And the second line was composed of 10 German squares. Although the Allied lines had not been broken by the cavalry, the situation was far from advantageous for Wellington. All his commanding officers were compelled to seek protection inside the squares, from where it inevitably became more difficult to exercise command. Due to the mounting losses of the French cavalry and the countercharges of the Dutch and Belgian carabineers, the French cavalry eventually fell back. Meanwhile, the French infantry kept failing against the stronghold of La Sainte but eventually managed to surround it. The Prince of Orange saw that the position had been cut off and rushed the Hanoverian battalion forward as reinforcements. This is when a unit of French cuirassiers concealed in the fold in the ground caught and destroyed it within minutes. Soon the French turned up the heat and captured La Sainte. After five hours of fighting, the French infantry pressed on. Their sudden appearance on the ridge provoked panic and consternation among the enemy squares. From the dominant heights, French skirmishers fired at the tightly packed squares. A bullet zipped right by Wellington, and a great number of Wellington's generals and aides were KIA or wounded in this particular phase of the battle. For example, the British 27th Foot Regiment lost more than two-thirds of its men during that part of the battle. If the French could bring just a little bit more infantry on that high ground and even their cannons, the Allied squares would have been devastated. And if they abandoned the square formation into battle lines, well, the French cavalry would have wiped them out. In the classic British retelling of the story, the Prussians arrived at the last hour, just in time to mop up the battlefield. Reality is much more different. The Duke of Wellington felt the wrath of Napoleon's army. He even said, give me Blücher or give me night. And now, just as Gandalf arrived on the heights of Helm's Deep, with an entire army of reinforcements, the first Prussian columns of von Bülow arrived on the battlefield. Blücher left the weaker Third Corps, commanded by Tillemann, at Vavre to face Grouchy, while his three other corps marched west. And another decisive factor was Grouchy's inaction during these hours. The moment he heard the cannons unleash their thunder symphony just a few kilometers away, an argument flared up among his staff. The experienced generals Gérard and Exelman pressed him to join the Emperor. Rumors go that Exelman was ready to terminate Grouchy if Gérard had accepted to take over command of the corps. In the end, Grouchy defeated the Prussians at Vavre, but it was a useless battle. So back to the main playground. Not only von Bülow arrived, 
25,000 Prussians from the Corps of von Zieten linked up with the British near Papelotte. This allowed Wellington to reinforce his crumbling center. I mean, at this point, it was GG well played. Napoleon faced encirclement of an enemy two times more numerous. Just like at La Rotière against Blücher a year before, it was a flanking attack that dealt the final blow. Lobo's entire 4th Corps and the valiant Young Guard were sent to stop the Prussians. 30,000 against 16,000. Just like at Ligny, the Battle of Plancenois reached an unimaginable level of violence. No prisoners. Many times, the 72-year-old Blücher rode to the front to rally his fleeing troops and send them back into battle. The French Young Guard Division reported 80% casualties and two-thirds of Lobo's corps ceased to exist. The final attack with the guard was undertaken too late with too few men, only 4,500 and at the wrong location. It was the last gamble since all the reserves were sent against the Prussians. As the guard advanced, they faced a wall of fire. This is when Dutch General Chassé noticed that the Allied troops on the front line were starting to fall back in disorder. Chassé was a Dutch general that fought with the French from 1799 to 1814. He was nicknamed General Bayonet by Napoleon himself for his heavy use of frontal attacks. Well, that day, as a division commander for the Kingdom of the Netherlands, Chassé told his 3,000 men to fix bayonets and they flanked the Imperial Guard. The Dutch troops saved the British at Quatre Bras and at Waterloo to the horror of General Chassé. The Duke of Wellington made no mention of the attack of his Dutch division in his report. Eventually, Plancenoit fell to the Prussians. Soon after, the French army disintegrated. In conclusion, even if Napoleon had pulled his best day and utterly crushed the Anglo-Dutch and the Prussians in Belgium, what now? There were another 20,000 Germans, 225,000 Austrians, and 168,000 Russians marching towards northern France. And Napoleon had just suffered massive casualties. Napoleon's final battle would have been a Leipzig 2.0 somewhere on the Rhine. In the end, Napoleon abdicated on the 22nd of June, 1815. However, the war was not over yet. Even without the emperor, his spirit remained and many more French soldiers would fall for a lost cause. A garrison of 400 held out for two months at Uneng against 20,000 Austrians. General Rapp defeated a German-Austrian army twice as numerous at La Soufelle. And on July 1st, Davout was victorious once again west of Paris against the Prussians. Ultimately, the French people had enough of war. The coalition captured Paris and King Louis XVIII was reinstated. Thank you to War Thunder for sponsoring this video. You can play War Thunder for free on PC, Xbox, and PlayStation. Remember to use my link in the description to get your exclusive bonus. Multiple premium vehicles, premium account, boosters, and much more. See you on the battlefield.